to actually get you to do the bulk of it now because it's only going to take two minutes to do, all right? And then, uh, then you can, all you have to do is to type it in and upload it. All right, so we're go actually, we're not going to do all of it now, but I'm just going to get you started. Uh, the, can I, they've only, I haven't actually photocopied all of the, all of the, uh, the, the assignment. Can I just borrow yours for a moment? Because I didn't get a copy. I only need the top one now. Oops, sorry. That, uh, okay. There are two parts to this then. The first is the response required from the original hearers and required today. Actually, these are, these are two separate things, but they could end up by being the same typically. So um, sometimes when we're reading the scriptures, we jump directly into what God is saying to us from the scriptures. And if we do that, sometimes we can actually miss out on really what God is saying to us. And it's much, you get more from it if you first say what was intended then, then you say, how do I get to this today? So let me give you an example of this. Um, suppose there was, uh, Paul is speaking, Paul says there's no, um, Christ came to break down the, the wall of division between Jew and Gentile and create one new man. He's saying that. What would be the, requ the response that Paul is expecting from the church that he's writing to if he says that? What would you expect? Just off the top of your head, what kind of response? How should they change their behavior? If he's saying Christ has come to break down the wall of division between Jew and Gentile. Yes, okay, so maybe he's addressing some tensions between different groups within the church, okay? And so how might that apply today generally in, in a church setting? Denomination or within a particular church, what could a wall be? Yep, different racial groups, different like strata of society, or what other groups could could you see in churches in your experience? What other kind classes? Yeah, and what else? Absolutely, like age groups. You know, you get the younger people, you get the who want change, and the conservative people who we've always done it like this. So, the, what you say is then, this the application for this, if I was preaching this, might be um, Jesus Christ has come to break down the walls of division between these different groups in our church. We're all one in Christ. Now, when it comes to a personal one, you say, what is God saying to me? Do I have any walls of division in my heart where I am not treating this, these people uh, in the same way as I'm treating these people, because these are my people and these are not my people. And so you say, what, Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me about this? Now, if you go through those three steps, you're more likely to, to uh, expand your mind to take in more possibilities of what God might be saying to you and open yourself up to more than if you go straight to the text for, to, to my heart. All right, so this is what I'm trying to get you to do. So what I want you to do right now, the passage is fresh in your mind. It's best to do this now rather than later tonight or tomorrow or the next day. Right now, take your assignment for the response sheets that I've just handed out to you. Uh, the one that you don't do, not do it. Here you go. <laughs> there you go. Take your assignment for the response sheet. And actually, I can put it up on the screen here and then we don't have to, I don't have to worry about it. Seeing it. There you go. In order to answer this, you must understand the kind of people to whom this book was written. Given all you've studied till now, the purpose of the book, the purpose of the passage, the arguments and points to be made, what response would the author have wanted to see in the original hearers? So a, a response might be, he would like to see Jew and Gentiles getting on to get better together. He would like to see people stopping getting drunk. He'd like to see people dot, 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 whatever. So would you write that down right now? This needn't be your final answer, but like, I'd like you to actually just write a sentence down now from your passage, which would be what he would, you think that he would like them to, s what the writer would like to see as a response from the people that, he, that, that they're writing to.
Okay, how are we doing? Okay. So I'm just going to stop you there because um, you may have more thoughts, but just for the sake of uh, moving on, I'm just going to uh, get you to stop. And maybe, <coughs> uh, do you want to share what you've got, Kevin? I wrote, uh, John desires a daily search for love one another. He wanted them to fully understand the importance of Jesus as one command in the body of one another. Great. That's, yeah, I don't know if I could improve on that. No, that's good. That's good. Amy, what do you, what do you have? Okay, yeah, that's good, yeah. Anyone else want to share? Do you want to share? Alice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I would like to see people seeking Christ but never be accepted by a God in your life. You'd like to see them respond by getting rid of a hermit just out of your life. Yeah, okay, that's good, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to go, it's okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what it is, isn't it? That's the, yeah. Koki, do you want to share what you've got? You don't. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay. All right. So now you you have to respond You have for today's one. Now, for, for today, um, it's not, not necessarily going to be that different to what you've got, but the, the application is different for each specific situation. God's word never changes. The message of James is not going to change. It's still going to be about you know, showing faith worked out in action. But the application will be different in every church. That is why we can't just have like a book of, of, of the scriptures applying what it means that's written once for all time. Uh, you, so you need to ask, in my circumstances, in whoever I'm, uh, the, the community of believers that I am part of, what would I see this addressing? So, um, uh, so if you would write that down then, just write that down, how you would say this if you were given the opportunity to share this on a Sunday morning with your, your uh, church family. If, somebody, if there's, there's the, uh, somebody said to you, okay, Alice, just would you like to just share with us what Scott's been saying to you through the scriptures this week and how this might be appropriate to our church? What would you say? Okay, so just put down a few words about that. I'm not going to ask you to read these out, so just uh, you can be, if you feel there's something dreadful happening in your church <laughs> right now, <laughs> you don't have to share that with everybody else. That's, uh, that's, uh, um, uh. So this is where the prophetic element comes in, I think, because... Uh, to, to move from what the scripture says to, from all, through all time to what it's saying to us now involves a certain like a prophetic uh, insight from God as to how it's speaking to us. Okay. Well, you can um, you can um, add a little bit more to that later if you want to, but I want to uh, just move on to the last bit. Okay. Personal response: How should I respond to these verses now? If we never ask ourselves this question, then we're doing a terrible thing, treating God's word as a textbook or an object to be examined. We're not like some scientist examining God's word, but the word is examining us. We should not approach to judge and dissect it, but to let the word judge and dissect us. So the final step is the climax and end point of exegesis. Discovering and interpreting the message of God is that God is communicating to me and obeying this message. Try and be as specific as you can here. Your paper will not be shown to anyone else. This should be answered in the first person. God is saying to me, dot, dot, dot. So if you look at what I've got here on the sheet that I've handed out, 
Um, God has challenged me that I'm too individualistic. I should view other Christians more in the way that Christ views them. I must give more attention, particularly to verse 2, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. For example, I'm apt to be irritated by some people, and it's very wrong and unchristlike. I'm not irritated by people now. I've, <laughs> I've, you know, I've grown out of that now. I must see Paul... The prisoner is the kind of person I want to be. Very weak by earthly standards, but showing an incredible example of love and sacrifice by the power of Christ living in him. So that's why I felt God was saying to me when I read that. So we're just going to take a moment now and just ask the Holy Spirit to, to, to open our hearts and make us vulnerable to what he wants to say to us. So let's just pr pray, shall we? Father, we thank you that... that you speak to us so clearly and so directly. And we pray, Lord, that you open our hearts to hear what you're saying now. And Lord, we, we confess that often our problem is not hearing you, but our problem is being willing to obey what you're saying. And Lord, we do pray that your, that your spirit will now just point out to us specifically what you're saying to us through this scripture now and, and make us ready to obey it and make us ready to be willing to go where you want us to go with this. Oh, we ask it, come right now in Jesus' name. Just speak to each one of us in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Just ask him now, just, just continue in a, moment, in a mode of prayer for a few moments, asking him to open this to your hearts, or open your hearts to what he's saying. So whenever you're ready, you can jot down your response. I didn't really want to stop you because, like, you're hearing from God, and I want to put an end to that. <laughs> so, so uh, I'm just going to give you a couple more moments to write things out and just uh, express what God's saying to you. So your answer, if your answer, if you what write down what you write down doesn't have the words me or I in it, then you're not doing it properly. It should have a me or an I at least in there. Um.
Okay, well, I'm actually going to just draw this bit to a close now because a couple of other things I want to cover. But you can add more to it yourselves. So um, has anybody felt that God is speaking to them through their passage? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so let me ask you, um, you've been doing hard work on your passage, haven't you? And sometimes we have a dualism in our culture between the Holy Spirit and hard work. Because somehow hard work is earthly and it's not, it's not, it can't be spiritual. That spiritual is a different world. And that if it's truly from God, it must, re- re- it must require no effort. You see what I'm saying? Um, there was a, a famous preacher called B.B. Warfield and somebody said to him, if you only had, um, if you could choose you would prepare a sermon, you could have 10 minutes on your knees or you could have eight hours of hard study. Which would you prefer? And he said, eight hours of hard study on my knees because he exposed the dualism that somehow praying and studying were different things. And so what I've tried to do this week is to show you that actually if we have the mind of Christ, if we have a new heart, then we're studying. It's the Holy Spirit who's empowering that. It's not a dualism where well, now I'm studying, now it's the flesh, now it's like earthly stuff, and now I'm praying and now it's spiritual. But the whole, the, the whole, if, we are tr- if we have the Spirit in us, then those things are engaged. In fact, our, the more like we are Christ, the more our thoughts become his thoughts, and we become naturally, our process, thought processes begin to change to become the processes of Jesus. It's not, there's not two things inside us, and Lord, we're now listening to the Spirit, now I'm doing this. It should become more and more naturally how we express ourselves. And so um, hopefully you'll have seen that there's not, there are not two worlds that are engaged in here. There's one world, and that the Spirit can be involved and permeate every part of this process. Okay, so um, I want to uh, just take a few minutes for if anybody's got any questions or or things they want to ask that not necessarily directly something I've covered here, but generally in the subject of interpreting scripture. Yeah. And you know we started off with the word study. Would you, if you were looking at a passage of scripture, would you do it in this pattern? Or would you maybe like, first of all, look at mm. the, maybe read the whole thing and then kind of like the whole... That's the a very good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, because generally you don't know what words you want to do a study on until you've actually started engaging in the passage. And you're absolutely right. I wouldn't start by doing the word study because um, I'm doing this as a, uh, as a series of processes that have a, a logical order in terms of going from mechanical through to spiritual. But I would probably begin by... Um, Produce, trying to write an outline of the of the passage and just reading it, yeah. And as I read through, um, as I tried to understand it verse by verse, that's when I would do the word study. The other thing is that I would tend to do l- maybe more mini word studies. I would tend to because if you were got Esau open, you needn't actually go through the full process that we've done. You could you can just right click on a word, search for it. And in a few seconds, what I tend to do is I, I actually click on the window. And as you do that, as you use the down arrow, it pops up the current verse in the, in the section below. And you can just go through and read all the verses. And, I'm, and I, so I'm not writing anything down. And if you're doing that, in about a minute and a half, you can, you can probably read all, all occurrences of that word. And so I would just go through doing that with a number of words in the passage, as I'm probably as I'm reading it. And so now that's a good question. Yeah. That's a good question. It depends on the scale of what I'm doing as well. Um, so, for example, I did uh, a, a sermon on God's mercy, and the, that's actually a Hebrew word, the word chesed. And so because it was particularly that word I was looking at, I did a massive word study because it occurs several hundred times. And so I did a very, very thorough word study on that because that's what the sermon was coming out of, that particular concept of God's loving kindness, his tender love to us. Um, whereas other words, other m- sermons I preach might not be so focused on something that's c- so mm-hmm. tight. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So, some more questions or some passage of scripture or whatever.
the lady from Africa. Okay. Um, in Colossians, in my passage, it's about our life being hidden in Christ in God. Yes. Yes, yeah, that actually is, is quite interesting. Um, I'm just wondering whether um, that actually is quite a remarkable passage of Scripture, and I'm just going to see if I have it here. No, I don't have it here. That's verse. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, I do. No, no, I don't. <laughs> I've got. No, I don't. I don't have it here. Let me just tell you though. Um, I'm just going to bring it up on. Um, bring up the scriptures here. Let me. Uh, don't actually. There's not e sword in the way I have it loaded right now. But I'll bring it up in another one, and I'll show you how this works. Um, this is something which, um, if we were taking longer on the course, I would be able to spend more time on, but it's looking at the way things are structured. And I'm going to just look at, it's Colossians 3, isn't it? Yes. Okay, 3. Okay, so, if then you've been raised with Christ, the, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. This is a, a particular structure which is quite common in Paul, which is where he says, he says A, B, B, A. And it's called a chiastic structure because the Greek letter chi or ki looks like that. It's a cross shape. So what he's saying is if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things of the, the above where Christ is. Set your mind to things on the above, not with things on, on the earth. And uh, um, so um, the next thing he says is um, the same. He repeats the same sort of pattern. You've died. You've died. Your life was hidden with Christ. When Christ appears, you will appear with him in glory. So that's the same thing again. Now, what happens is um, what he's dealing with the first one. The first one he's dealing with the future. The future. Uh, um, Sorry, a future reality. He, s he says, I'm, I'm sorry, no, the second one is the future. This is the present reality. You have died. You've been raised with Christ. So set your. So it's a statement of fact, a motivation based on that statement, another motivation based on that statement, a statement of fact. So you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above. Christ is at the right hand of God. So set your mind on the things that are above, not on things on the, on the earth. And so it's a fact Future motivation, future motivation, fact. So he's motivated, and this is so Paul is trying to get them to live a particular life. So the motivation is, look, this is what has happened to you in the past. These are the events that have happened to you. So then he says, he switches to the future motivation. This is what's going to happen. Uh, uh, Christ is going to appear. Uh, you have died. This is the fact. Uh, uh, Christ is going to appear. Uh, when he appears, you will appear with him in glory. So, in glory. So, put to death what's I what's uh, earthly in you. So that's the motivation. A second motivation is that uh, God's wrath is coming on the um, the unbelievers that walk in this way, and so you must put on that motivation. This is not really laid out in a way that enables me to demonstrate this clearly. But and then he ends up by saying, um, so don't lie to one another because you put on the new self. So just in broad brush, it's following a structure that's Paul's giving a statement and a motivation and a motivation and a statement. But it's very intricately worked together because the first one is about what's happened in the past on the cross, and the second one is what happens when Jesus returns. And the, what he puts in here is a statement, uh, your life is hidden with Christ in God. So when he switches to the future, he says, your life will appear. So um, this is actually um, something which I'm going to be talking a little bit about in the Romans course. But it's one of the fundamental ideas in Paul is that, that the old creation and the new creation. So the old creation is what you see around you here. 
So if I was to, to take Kevin and examine him and put him under a microscope, I'd find molecules and atoms. And in fact, it'd be the same stuff as the walls are made of and the trees. It's, it's atoms, it's molecules. It's the stuff Adam was made of. It's, it's the stuff of this earth, dust. He was made from dust and he returned to dust. Okay, so the old creation was made, Adam was made of the old creation. We're all part of the old creation. Now, when Jesus was raised from the dead, something new happened in Jesus. He was raised the firstborn of the new creation and his body was made out of something different. Do you know what he was made from? It, the, he was. Now, this is a little complex because the spirit is another member of the Trinity. So how can one member of the Trinity have a body made from another member of the Trinity? So let's not get into the complexities. I'll try and explain this a little bit more when we do Romans. But this is what 1 Corinthians 15 says. The, old, the first man was made of the flesh. The second man is made of the spirit. Let me just tell you just broadly the, 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 um, the stuff that the new man is made of is in the dimension of spirit. Holy Spirit, rather than being in the dimension of flesh. Now, what that means is that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was a, a man made of something entirely different to Adam's. He was made of, um, of a new kind of stuff. And the, the old stuff eventually will die. It decays. It's in, eventually, it will all be gone. The new stuff will last for eternity. Now, when you become a Christian, you're born again, or literally born from above, and some of this stuff gets put in you. And so inside you, Kevin, there is a new creation, which we can't see, but it's, it's made of this new stuff. It's made of spirit. And, and even though your old body will pass away, you, know, you could be put in the grave, you could rot, you turn to dust, the new part will survive. It is eternal. It's made of spirit. It is something that is new and is part of the new creation. And just as your physical body is inherited from Adam, this new stuff, this new person it comes from Christ. You're a descendant of Christ. He is the firstborn of the new creation. You descend from him. And I don't think we understand the, um, the importance of this idea because we define ourselves in old categories and Paul defines us in new categories. And this is right the way through. When you see it, it's all about putting off the old, putting on the new, because the new is who we really are. Now, the new is we're made of, of uh, we're new creation, we're made of Jesus. We have, uh, and the new creation functions very differently. The old is under law. The new is actually um, the, the, the stuff that the new creation breathes in of is faith and love. It's, it, it exists in faith, its spirit exists in faith, and the way it's expressed is, is in love. Now, um, the, the, the point, the fundamental point here is that this new creation is not visible right now. You can't see it, it's hidden. It's, I can't look at you, I can never look at him and say, oh, something new creation about you. I can see, I can see it shining inside you there. You can't see it, it's hidden. There's no way that you can see it. You can see its effects. Jesus talks about the spirit blows. You can't see the spirit. You can see the effects. So I can see a change of life, but I can't see the new creation. Now, what happens is that this, so it says your life, this is your new life, is hidden with Christ in God. So this new creation is the, the, the descendant, you're a descendant of Christ. Just it's the, the Christness in you as opposed to the Adamness in you. So um, you're hidden with Christ in God. When Christ appears, so this hidden is opposed in this structure to appears. The hidden is what it is now. When Jesus comes again, when we see him, we will be like him. We will be raised a new body. We will have a complete new body, not just the part that you can't see, but we will be completely renewed with a new perfect body. So, so that's what's going on in this text. And actually, this turns out to be the fundamental idea in all Paul's writings. And I'm going to argue in the Romans course, it's actually in the scriptures. In fact, I'm going to argue that, it's, um, that the whole old covenant, new covenant, can be better understood as old creation, new creation. I'm going to argue that. But we'll have to wait till the Romans class before we get to that. So... Yeah, so, so um, I, this is so important because um, people, 
people don't, they so misunderestimate the radicalness of what's happened to us. They, we downplay it. You know, you're a Christian and it's like something's been bolted onto your life. You, you're, you've got, you know, you've got um, Christians enjoy things more. You know, Christians have got hope. And the radicalness of what's happened to us, we lose it in, in, in the way that we talk about becoming a Christian. There's something that's so different about what's happened to us. And this, so that's an excellent question because what you've hit on there is actually the core of Paul's theology. It's about the new and the old. Actually, you can you can demonstrate that Jesus' teaching on the kingdom actually is all, the kingdom and the new creation amount to pretty much the same thing. And it's about the old and the new, the old one skin to the new. And he's constantly contrasting the old way of doing things and the new. And the old is always attached to the old creation. Now, there's not a dualism. In some ways, you could say, well, there's a dualism here, Andrew. Well, the, it's, the dualism usually is to do with good and evil. And it's not the old creation. It's evil because Jesus participated in the old creation. He entered the old creation. So it can't be evil. Um, in some senses, there is a dualism that in terms of being a new reality. The new is a new reality. But they still, part, they still relate to one another. They're not entirely different dimensions. We, we exist in both right now. That's our problem. We've got one foot in the old and one in the new. And until you die, you're going to be participating in the old creation. There's no, there's no way you can get out of that. You're going to be participating in it. And so the, the problems that Christians have all come down to living in the two creations at the same time. Yeah. So, good, cre- good question. I bet you didn't realize how good it was when you asked it. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry I couldn't find the picture because I can demonstrate how the structure is, is quite exciting. Yeah. So, um, any other questions? Okay. Well, I'm just going to take, we've got another 15 minutes. I'm just going to. Um, talk very briefly about um, an aspect of the big picture that I didn't really cover as we were going through. And I don't have notes for this, but I'll just... We've talked about the old covenant and the new covenant as being the, the framework. But what I haven't really said is that the old covenant wasn't given all at once. There was a progressive revelation. And when we're reading the Old Testament, uh, we see that right at the beginning... There's, very, there's not very much clarity about what God's going to do with the earth. So the very first hints that we have is when Adam and Eve sinned, God came and promised Eve and said that, uh, in, for, that the seed of the, the serpent will, will bruise the, the heel of your seed, but your seed will crush the head of the serpent. Now what that m- was talking about, the seed of course being the descendants, and that Satan would attempt to destroy the, um, the line of Jesus, and that, but ultimately Jesus would crush the head of, us, of Satan. So that, but that's all they had. Like, we know now what that means, but can you imagine Eve thinking, what is this heel, like serpent? What, do I have to avoid snakes? You know, what, what would she think? So as time went on, we see every um, period increases clarity till Isaiah the prophet is talking about by his stripes we're healed. He'll be like a lamb going to the slaughter and really detailed prophecy. So there is a progress in Revelation and this progress doesn't come uniform, like a little bit at a time in an even way. It comes in chunks. It comes like a period with nothing and then there's a huge chunk. And so there's not much for a long time. And then there's the revelation to Noah of the flood. And then there's not much. And then there's Abraham starts getting revelation. And then there's a period with not much in Egypt. And then there's this massive amount comes through Moses. Massive amount. The whole sacrificial system comes through. This vast chunk of revelation comes, um, but with a huge questions. And then there's a period of, of judges, a lot of confusion, um, and then there's like Ruth comes. And when I was when I was studying this, uh, when I was studying theology, what one of the things we had to do, as an as an exercise, is you to take a book of the Bible, like Amos, for example, and say what did as Amos added to the total knowledge. And if you will see a timeline of what was known up to that point in the Bible, uh, what did Amos add? And then you take the next book, Ezekiel. What did Ezekiel add? What did Jeremiah add? It's really interesting because you have to put yourself in the 
the, the point in time of an Israelite living right then, and this is all I'm allowed to know. And then this, this prophet comes, what do I now know that I didn't know before? So it's really interesting to do that. So uh, another big chunk came through David. Now, if you imagine an Israelite at the time, all you know is the law. You've, you know Moses' law. You know all that stuff. You've got no real joy in worship. Like there were no songs that they would sing. There was no that whole system of worshiping God in joy wasn't there. And then David comes with all of these psalms. Incredible deposition de 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 of truth that the Spirit brings. That now they're coming to, and that whole stuff about forgiveness in Psalm 51. You know, all the stuff about um, Jesus coming, the pr prophetic songs about Jesus, Psalm 2, being prophetic about Jesus. And then um, uh, Song of Solomon comes. You know, what is this? This is a romance, but like there's some stuff in here which may be, transcends that. Some of the Psalms, similar to Song of Solomon, about some sort of romance about God. And then some of the prophets actually using language of love. God saying, you know, you're my beloved um, uh, Hosea, the picture of, of Israel being like his, his wife that he saw him, but she's committed adultery and him wooing her back again. And all that imagery, just a huge revelation about God. And so Whenever you're reading a passage in the Old Testament, it's actually not just, is this Old Covenant or New Covenant? But it's useful to say, where is this in the progress of revelation? Are we, during Moses' time, is this back in the first five books, the Pentateuch? Or are we in a period of, say, after David, when we've had this huge revelation? Or are we later on in the prophets in Isaiah, where there's massive uh, revelation about Oh, what this is going to be. There's a series of uh, songs called the Servant Songs, the Suffering Servant Songs in Isaiah, which are about Jesus. They're also about Israel. They're about what God desired for Israel, but it, Jesus took them on and fulfilled them. And actually, in a sense, we fulfill them as well. But these songs, these servant songs, of which... Um, um, the, the, the by his stripes we're healed, that's part of one of the servant songs. These are really explicit in many ways about the coming servant that God was going to send, who was, who was Jesus. And Jesus, there's more from Isaiah quoted in the New Testament than any other book of the Old Testament. And the reason is because there's so much clarity in Isaiah about what was going to happen in the New. So, um, so um, when I've given you... Uh, a model which says old covenant, new covenant, that is uh, only the first step. That's rather an oversimplification of it. There's this progress of revelation that we're getting. So also through that, you see uh, a story being unfolded, which is the story that began in Genesis with the promise to Eve. Through her child, the, the Savior would come. In a essence. Now, does Satan know the future? No, he doesn't. He doesn't know the future. He doesn't know the future. And uh, <laughs> yes, he doesn't know the future. So he didn't know any more than God had revealed. But what you see in the story of the line of Jesus is a history of the attacks of the serpent on the, the seed of of the woman, the seed of Eve. In the book of uh, Revelation, we have one of the pictures in Revelation, I think it's Revelation 13. He says, I saw um, a woman ready to give birth, and I saw a dragon, and the dragon was trying to consume the, 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 the child that the woman was given. And the, 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 the woman is actually the picture of uh, the people of God in the old covenant, the people of God who were, if you like, carrying the seed of Jesus. And eventually it was Mary, and Mary gave birth to Jesus. And uh, in a sense, that the, the, there's a sense in which this continues as the people of God in the image in Revelation. But the, the, this is the image. Now, what you actually see is throughout the history of the Old Testament actually is the history of this attack. So let's think how this goes through. Satan knows that at some point, one of the children of Eve is going to be the Messiah. So what's he going to do? Well, he's going to try and corrupt the... He doesn't know who it is. He's going to try and corrupt the entire earth. So the entire... He doesn't know that it's through Noah. 
the line. God knows the line. So what God does, he says, okay, the earth is becoming so corrupt, I'm actually going to make a new beginning here, and we're going to make a new beginning through um, Noah. And Noah is the one the line's coming through. So again, after the flood, Satan tries to corrupt the whole earth, but because of the new things being a little different now, it's a little harder. But... Um, God says, okay, now I'm going to choose Abraham to, to, to send my line. Now, there's a problem with Abraham becoming the father of, or of Jesus. Barren. And actually, you discover that there are a number of barren women throughout the history of Jesus. This is an attack from Satan to prevent Jesus being, being uh, coming to pass. So if you follow the line of of Abraham, the story of Abraham, the story of Abraham isn't just the story of, of, of a guy living that long ago. It's the story of somebody carrying the seed of Jesus being attacked all the time. You see attacks on Satan. And in fact, there's one very interesting story where uh, just about a year before Isaac was born, Abraham goes down to Egypt and Abraham says to Sarah, um, I'm afraid that the king of uh, Pharaoh in Egypt is going to want to marry you, and so he's going to kill me so he can marry you. So please do me this favor and say that you're my sister, not my wife. Do you know the story? Yeah. Strange story. So they go down, and uh, now the remarkable thing is Sarah must have been incredibly beautiful because she was 99 years old at this time. Can you imagine a woman so beautiful that even at 99, the king wants to take her into his harem? So anyway, so... Uh, he and this happens. The king actually, Pharaoh, does want to take her into his harem, but um, and then he gets plagued, and God says to him, "You're plagued because you've taken this woman." Now he hasn't actually had sex with her at this time. When he re re realizes what's happened, he gives her back, and God heals him. So what's going on with this? Well, Satan is behind this because Satan wants e uh, Sarah to to. Um, no longer to be able to be the mother of Isaac and wants her to become part of Pharaoh's harem and to destroy the purposes of God. So what's going on? Why is this story in Scripture? What's the purpose of this story? Like if I read this story, so if I'm reading this story, a lot of Christians will say, well, you know, maybe this is a story about how we, um, we mustn't lie. You know, we take a moral story. Abraham lied, we shouldn't lie. What's it about? Okay, other people will say, I have no idea why this story is there. But actually, the, what that story is teaching us, that God is so faithful to his purposes that even if we mess up, like Abraham messed up, God is still going to bring about his purposes. And Abraham, in the end, was saved from the stupidity of his action by God. And so actually it's a message of encouragement that God is so committed to bring his purposes about that actually even through our mistakes, he will actually bring his purposes about. So we only understand the, that story, the purpose of that story, if we see the big picture, the big picture being Jesus. So we go on through the story. We see um, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob with all the stupid things he's doing, God is in there making sure he doesn't mess up, caring for him, providing for the line. Then we see there's a famine coming in. God's going to bring them down to Egypt and send somebody ahead, Joseph, to prepare a place for the nation to begin because God is going to protect them from the famine. They come. Then we see one of the most critical points, Pharaoh. Pharaoh is almost like a manifestation of the dragon. He is going to kill every male child of Israel in order to get the Messiah. He doesn't know he's after the Messiah. Satan does. Satan says, every, says uh, tell the midwives to, to drown every male child who comes of Israel. Remember the story? When else does Satan try that tactic to kill? Exactly. It's not a coincidence that Herod does the same thing as Pharaoh does because it's the dragon behind it going after the line of Jesus. Now, I could tell you story after story after story, right the way through, when you see this happening, there's a specific attack. Another point where it comes to the climax is when uh, Samuel anoints David to be the king. Now Satan knows that David is going to be the one who, the anointed one comes through. 
So then, Satan uh, comes against Israel with a champion. Who's the champion that he brings against Israel? Goliath. Goliath, when we read the description of Goliath, it says he has scaly armor. If you read a literal translation, the word is actually scaly. You can do a word study on it. It's scaly. It's actually chain mail. It's actually discs of metal that they would stitch to their leather clothes to make armor. Um, scaly armor. So what's he a manifestation of? He's a manifestation of Satan. So um, what we have then is the champion of God's people represented by David, but actually Jesus, going against, against the champion of the evil one. Uh, who's, so that confrontation between, between David and Goliath is actually the confrontation between Jesus and the evil one. Now, I actually think that David understood what he was doing. He knew he was anointed. I think he knew what he was doing. One of the reasons was, which part of Goliath did David go for? His head. And once he killed him, what did he then go and do? Cut off his head. I think he knew the prophecy to Eve that you will, the, the, the seed of the woman would destroy the seed of the serpent. And I think he identified himself as the seed of the woman because he knew he was in the line. He'd been anointed. And so what often we misunderstand this and we say, oh, no, you've got to be like David. You've got to go out against Goliath. You know, what are the Goliaths in your life? Actually, that's not how we understand it. Jesus has destroyed Goliath. Jesus is the champion. He's destroyed him. And what happened after Goliath was killed, the Israelites then ran out and chased the Philistines away and took all the stuff from them, took all the spoil from them. And that's how we should apply the story to ourselves. We don't have to fight Goliath. Jesus has done it. He's our champion. Um, the trouble is the Israelites had chosen Saul, who was a giant, and they were trusting in Saul. The message is, don't trust in Saul. Don't be like the nations, trust in Jesus. And what we're called to do is to now go out and to chase the enemy who's defeated in Jesus. So if we understand that story in the context of the big picture, we will interpret it very differently to, oh, it's just another cute story in the Old Testament that we tell children, you know? It's, so right the way down the line, time and time again, we have the same battle. Another one would be one of the kings of Israel, uh, when he died, this is one of the kings of Judah, when he died, his wife wanted to retain power, and so she killed all of the children, except one baby called baby jo Josiah, who was hidden. What's going on in that story? It's, it's Satan. Again, twice that happened, actually, in the history of, of the kings of Judah. There was an attempt to kill every single male offspring of the king, and one survived. So one was, was Joash, the other one was Josiah. Right the way through. So if you read the Old Testament and you have those, those eyes on, you understand that this is going on. And, and so when you apply it to yourself, you can apply it to the fact that this is the, the anointed one, the Jesus figure, who is actually God's provision for our salvation. Okay. All right. So, good. Well, I'd just like to close in just, just praying for your... Um, okay, let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for the Spirit. We thank you for the new covenant. Lord, we thank you that you right now are living in us, that in each one of us, there is something of Jesus that's been born in us, even though it's invisible, it's hidden there. And one day this, this body will fall away like a husk and the new butterfly will emerge and fly into eternity. And thank you, Lord, for that. But thank you, Lord, that, uh, that you've given us this amazing truth of the new covenant in Scripture. You've taught us about who we are. You've taught us about how we should live and how we can follow Jesus and how we have a new heart. And Father, we pray that you will open the Scriptures to us just as, as Jesus opened the Scriptures to these two disciples and they said, our hearts burned within us. Lord, we pray that our hearts will burn within us as we read your Scriptures and we'll be so excited as we hear you clearer and clearer. And through your truth, Lord, through your truth, the Spirit will lead us to be more like Jesus and have more victory and be more effective in your kingdom and, and be closer to you and experience more of you. Lord, we pray. And I pray, Lord, for these, these people here and for, for Katie who's not here, Lord, that your, that your Spirit will be on them now, Lord, as they read your Scriptures. Lord, I pray for your, your truth, Lord, to, to 
fill them, your truth to change them as, as, as your...